Welcome back to Bombastic Nation and Ting and Ting and Ting. I'm Mr. Giant and I'm back with some more vibes for all you. And we're continuing the Hannibal series. Yeah. Now, when we left off, the Hannibal was uh, entering Rome, picking up allies as he go from tribes that are turning against Rome. So he's strengthening and going in there. And uh, this one is uh, the Battle of Trivia. 2018 BC uh, part 4 and we're still in the second Punic War so let's see the military trickery that uh, Hannibal is going to use as he uh, advance onto Rome let's YouTube and Sim Simmer yeah. this video is supported by our sponsor The Great Courses Plus after the defeat of Ticinus, the Roman Senate looks to save face by blaming Gallic allies for being ineffective. Taking comfort in the fact that Hannibal has yet to face the vaunted Roman infantry, Longus' arrival in northern Italy restores confidence. Hannibal now faces armies of both Roman consuls. Let's go! It's early December, 218 BC. Publius Scipio's life still hangs in the balance due to wounds he sustained at Ticinus. But, ironically, his troubles are only just starting. His defeat at Ticinus has major consequences for Rome. It directly caused the garrison at Clastidium to surrender the town's massive grain depot. This strips his army of food reserves and disrupts his supply lines, making any advance into enemy territory a risky venture. At the same time, Hannibal finally replenishes his own reserves, which were dwindling ever since he descended from the Alps, right until the clash had taken us just a few days ago. The damage to Roman prestige raises the danger of further defections. What's worse, Gallic tribes are flocking to join Hannibal, enthused TM by his tribes, to defeat the Romans at his softer administrative touch. Scipio has no option but to retreat, realizing he is deep in hostile territory. He marches to Placentia and makes camp across the Po River. Hannibal pursues and catches up two days later Learning of his arrival, over 2,000 Gauls allied to Rome rise up in the camp and attack Roman soldiers, killing many in their sleep. Wow. Before sunrise, they cross the Trebia to join Hannibal, bringing with them the severed heads of slain Romans. Using the Gallic defection as propaganda, Hannibal makes sure to spread the word that Rome's allies are joining him en masse, thereby boosting his popularity among the tribes. Scipio again moves south, not wanting to risk being caught in the open. A day later, he reaches the hills and sets up camp in a strong position, with hills protecting his flanks from cavalry attacks. Then he settles in and waits for reinforcements. By mid-December, the two consuls join forces. Discussing how to confront Hannibal, Scipio argues against taking the field stressing that Longus' troops lack experience and need additional training, having been raised less than a year ago. Longus disagrees and sets up camp a few kilometers north from Scipio's position. Just as eager to fight as Longus, divided. Hannibal maintains his camp on the flat plain and surveys the potential battlefield west of the Trebia River. Meanwhile, he sends a raiding party to ravage the area along the river, suspecting that Gallic tribes living there, who pledged allegiance to him, are now negotiating with the Romans. It's unclear if the Gauls intended to betray Hannibal, but with their villages now being raided, some of the tribesmen appealed to the Romans for help. Longus promptly sends 1,000 velites across the river to attack the raiders. See, that, that was a smart move, you know what I mean? Because think about it look at what they did to Scipio you know what I mean while in this camp you know they, they pillage and then they, 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 they try to destroy it 
and then they took off and joined him. So that seems that shows a little bit of them being fickle. So he took decisive action, you know. What if they did this to me? Bam. You know what I mean? I don't trust them. So let's go take care of them and uh I guess take over the villages and stuff, which is even closer to the Roman uh garrisons or whatever that they have on the other side. So in his in essence, he's just covering his butt right there, you know what I mean? Stopping any uh, betrayal from happening. I mean, it was brutal, but I understand why he did it. He don't know, or he didn't know. With Hannibal's troops scattered across the area and encumbered by plunder, Roman troops start picking off small groups of Carthaginians, quickly routing the raiders. Seeing this, troops on duty outside Hannibal's camp rush to the aid of the retreating raiding party. The fighting is fierce, as both sides want to prove their superiority. But the Roman Velites are soon forced into a fighting retreat. The skirmish escalates rapidly, spreading across a large area. More and more troops from each side join in. Pockets of clashes develop as neither side is able to shore up its ranks. It becomes apparent that a chaotic skirmish might turn into a full-scale battle that neither commander will be able to control. Hannibal takes the initiative. He stops sending more troops into the fray, trying to avoid a battle that he did not plan and could do little to influence. He then audaciously rides out in person and rallies the scattered troops. He pulls them back and arrays them in a line outside the camp. The Romans advance, but Hannibal restrains his men from advancing on the enemy. The Romans too halt their advance, refusing to attack the well-positioned Carthaginians, who can now be supported from the camp with projectiles and fresh troops. The day draws to a close. There's like a stalemate. Hannibal demonstrates his shrewdness by not committing to an uncertain battle, and by restraining his troops, he exhibits what he would become so famous for his extraordinary ability to exercise control over his army. I control over the other army too. Satisfied in scoring the victory against Hannibal's troops, their morale and confidence partially restored. Longus, who is described by sources as having an aggressive temperament, shows his eagerness to do battle as soon as possible. He won't have to wait long. At dawn, Roman guards sound the alarm. The Carthaginians are attacking the camp. Awoken to projectiles flying over the palisades, Roman troops are ordered to get ready for battle. On empty stomachs, the men rush to form up in front of their tents in frigid conditions. Longus sends all 4,000 of his cavalry against the Numidians, closely followed by 6,000 Velites. But the Numidians soon break off. As the fighting moves north, the fast cavalrymen engage in hit and run tactics. Longus marches out with the rest of his army to meet the enemy. Heavy infantry forms into three columns, each some 3.5 kilometers long. They lag behind the cavalry in Velites and make steady progress. Numidians continue to avoid a direct confrontation with the Roman cavalry in Velites. Meanwhile, Hannibal gathers his officers to lay out his plans. He offers words of encouragement and orders them to ready the men for battle. Well rested and well fed, Carthaginian troops take to the field. To the east, the skirmish continues. The Numidians find themselves backed against the Trevia. They start crossing the river as they continue to pull back, pursued by the Romans. Arriving with the infantry and eager for battle, Longus orders the army to deploy on the western bank. The three columns begin crossing, chest deep in the freezing water. Meanwhile, Hannibal sends 8,000 infantry forward to support the Numidian retreat and to provide a screen for his own deployment. My man is a bit. About one kilometer towards the approaching Romans. 
across the field, Longus's army takes several hours to deploy. After fording the cold trivia, his men are hungry, soaked, and standing in the near freezing temperature. The Roman consul places his Velites in the front, forms his veteran infantry in the center, with Gallic and Allied infantry on either side, and cavalry on the flanks. Hannibal deploys his infantry in a thin line, Gallic allies in the center, with Spanish and Libyan infantry on either side. Elephants flank the infantry, while the Numidian and Gallic cavalry is further wide. Around noon, Longus orders his entire line to advance, confident in the clear numerical advantage of his heavy infantry. The Romans advance in good order. The flat plain, free from any obstacles, seems an ideal battleground for their style of warfare. Meanwhile, Hannibal holds the line, letting the enemy come to him. Skirmishers get into range and begin exchanging projectiles. With Valeric slingers in their ranks, combining with javelinmen, the Carthaginians quickly get the upper hand against the Roman Velites, who used up many of their javelins while pursuing the Numidian cavalry earlier in the day. Skirmishers from both sides withdraw through the gaps as the main lines of infantry close in. The heavier, more compact Roman infantry pushes the Carthaginian line back, causing heavy casualties to Hannibal's Gallic infantry in the center. On the flanks, Hannibal orders his cavalry to push forward. He's flanking. Some of the Roman horses become frightened by Hannibal's elephants, causing disruption within the ranks. A group of Roman velites, specially trained to deal with elephants, mix with the cavalry and attack the terrifying beasts, wounding and killing many. Eventually, the Numidians manage to overwhelm and advance against the Roman cavalry. But despite Roman flanks being pushed back, the Carthaginian center is crumbling. Veteran legionnaires are hacking through the Gallic infantry. Without any reinforcements available, it seems that Hannibal cannot stop the onslaught. But what the Romans don't know is that while surveying the field on the eve of battle, Hannibal personally picked 2,000 elite troops and positioned them in a dry riverbed hidden from view. Now, they emerge from the ravine with perfect timing, just as the Numidians finally rout the Roman cavalry, poised to encircle the enemy. Pressed from the front by elephants, Carthaginian infantry and skirmishers, the wings of the Roman infantry buckle as the Numidians attack their rear. You know, you hear about all of this in history and stuff like that, but it's kind of fascinating watching it, watching how Hannibal, uh, he planned this out, had people hiding there, and he's always coming from the back, man. He's always coming from the back and getting them. You know what I mean? It's just as intricate as now. It's just, you know what I mean? And, and I would say there were, there was better military minds back then because we, we find in more efficient and more technologically advanced ways to kill each other you know whereas this was you know positioning men in the right spot and stuff like that maybe they still do that now but with technology maybe not so much but i mean look this stuff is uh, what well, this stuff is just amazing how they, they did that stuff how unfortunately they position human bodies to take the uh brunt of uh of the war itself, the actual field battles. While Hannibal's center collapses as the veteran Roman heavy infantry cuts right through the Carthaginian line, still unaffected by the encirclement thanks to their discipline and organization. However, realizing the battle is lost, the legionnaires retreat back across the river to Placentia, maintaining their battle formation. Roman casualties are heavy, likely around 28,000 dead or wounded, while the Carthaginian losses are much lower, between 3,000 and 5,000. Wow. Losing most of his elephants, possibly all but one, is the only major loss for Hannibal at Trebia. In just a matter of weeks, Hannibal outperformed both Roman consuls with superior planning, near perfect coordination and control of his troops. 
News of the defeat rocks the Roman Senate and causes widespread panic among the population. The damage to Roman prestige persuades many more Gauls to join Hannibal. Additional attacks on Roman outposts and towns cause further disruption, before cold weather finally forces armies of both sides into winter quarters. But as Hannibal's devastating campaign in Italy gains momentum, a seemingly minor event in Iberia could threaten the Carthaginian war effort in the long run. Wow. The battles of the Second Punic War belong among the greatest in history. Some of which you can see on the Great Courses Plus in the highly detailed Decisive Battles of World History, a 36 lecture course that features dynamic video lectures to all lectures all right. on the Great Wow. That's some crazy fight in there, man. You know, he really outsmarted them. And like I said, he didn't just control his troops. He actually psychologically controlled their troops too. You know what I mean? Even though they fight gallantly, you know what I mean? He still had some control, especially in the first part where he, uh, he just had his men go back on all in the meantime, hiding people in, uh, in certain spots to come around the rear. Man, genius stuff. You know what I mean. I'm gonna leave a link in the description for this video. Go check it out. You know you could watch the whole series all without me cutting through or talking and giving those pieces when I see things happening. <laughs> but you know what I mean. Y'all take care of each other. All right. Cool runnings.